Hi, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Lola and today we're going to talk about two books that I recently but kind of not recently read. Whatever, it's been a little bit of time since I decided to record this video. Um, we're going to be talking about The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson and um, The Hollow Places by T. Kingfisher. Before we talk about the books, I am going to read out of my Encyclopedia of Spirits. I'm just going to pick a random page. Maria Leonza. All right, this one is kind of a long one. Origin, Venezuela. Maria Leonza names a goddess, maybe two, and a spiritual tradition. Maria Leonza is a snake goddess with dominion over love, romance, sex, fertility, and abundance invoked for protection, success, and virtually anything a devotee desires. Her origins are the subject of diverse legends. Common factors are her green eyes and a giant anaconda. Uh, Maria Leonza was first venerated by Venezuela's Indians. A prophecy foretold that the birth of a green-eyed child among them was a harbinger of disaster. Sure enough, the green-eyed baby girl was born right before the Spanish conquest. Different tribes have different versions of what happened to her and how she became goddesses. Here are a few of the differences. She may have been closely guarded or sent to live alone on a mountain. An anaconda fell in love with her and she became its queen. Thrown into a lake as a sacrifice for an anaconda spirit, she emerged as a goddess. Or when she saw her reflection in a lake, she transformed into an anaconda. And this could be like, they could believe in some of these or all of them. Uh, Maria Leonza rules nature, all living waters, animals, and plants. In addition to sources of water, her sacred sites include mountains and caves. Maria Leonza punishes those who harm or kill wild animals, as well as those who cut down forest trees. Originally a local jungle goddess, her veneration spread. She is now the primary focus of a rapidly expanding religion named after her. Devotees known as Maria Leonceros call her Venezuela's spiritual queen. Uh, there's like a little thing here. There's like a whole story after this, which I'm not going to read because it goes into the other side, but that's interesting. Maria Leonza. All right, now we're going to get into the books. Um, first, we're going to start with The Hollow Places. I'm probably going to talk about some spoilers for each of them. I'll have timestamps down in the description below. So, The Hollow Places. Basic premise of The Hollow Places is uh, you follow your main character and narrator, Kara, also nicknamed Carrot for some reason. Uh, she has recently gone through a divorce. She is kind of moving back in with her parents. You know that whole like desperate part in your life where you're just like, shit, I feel like I'm stepping backwards. That's what's going on with her. But her uncle says, hey, why don't you help me with my museum? Because I'm getting a little old. I could use the help. He has a museum that is a very strange museum. Like it has a bunch of taxidermy, weird shit that like most people would just kind of look at this and be like, this just looks like it either belongs in a dumpster or, you know, only crazy people have this. So she goes to live at the museum. And one day, a portal appears, or rather, a giant hole in the wall of the museum. And she's also pretty good friends with the cafe owner. He's like the brother of the owner, and he's like taking care of it for now for his sister. Uh, but they're right next door to the museum. Simon is his name, and he's basically your like token best friend gay man. And I genuinely en enjoyed him. He was just a very funny... Um, sarcastic and light-hearted kind of character. I enjoyed him. He had sass. He was great. Uh, but he and her, so Karen and Simon, decide to go explore this hole in the wall and it leads into another dimension. A lot of things that I did enjoy about this book was the humor. It had a lot of humor. Kara herself kind of looks at everything in a very rationalized, sarcastic way. Some people process information like that. I know I do. Now, I do know that that type of narration, even for me, it got a little bit annoying because it's supposed to be a horror book. But from what I read and also from the reviews that I've seen, not a lot of people consider it horror. They consider it more like really dark fantasy or horror fantasy. Um, and I get why. Her rationalization and her humor kind of brings down the horror factor. It makes things a lot less scary. 
And I do overall think that the pacing was good as well. Like the story, I kept reading it because I was like, this isn't bad. Like I am entertained, but I was extremely disappointed. I don't want to say that this is a spoiler, but if you really don't like books being ruined for you at all or like not knowing anything about it, maybe don't listen to this part. So I'll put like mild spoiler here. Um, so they go into that other world, right? And this other world is very creepy. It's set up really well. Honestly, the author did such a good job with setting up environments and setting. Really good. Like the museum, awesome. Um, the other dimension. I was genuinely spooked by it. I was like, oh, this is interesting and creepy and I love it. But then they don't stay there. They end up going back to the museum. And that is what I really was disappointed by. I chalked it up to this book not wanting to cater to horror fans, but rather write a horror book for more of a general audience, right? Because it felt very like easy to read. Like I genuinely wasn't really scared that many times. There were like two moments where I was like, this is disturbing, but it didn't go further. So I was like, okay, that that's not that bad then. Um, a couple like spoiler parts that I want to talk about. These are mostly like just plot holes that I have that I don't enjoy. So the book did have a lot of plot holes. And here are the ones that bother me. One, the, f the first time they go into the like hallway, into the hole in the wall, and they find the bunker, and they find the dead guy on the bed, I'm just like, there's a hallway that leads to the museum, right? How the fuck did the dead guy in the bed not find that hallway and not like realize, oh, there's a wall here that I can just hit? Or is that how the portal works? Like the whole like other dimension portal thing, I didn't understand. I was like, how does this work properly because then there also is a mention of like a military type of thing that goes in there and researches this other world, this other plane of existence. So are they able to control the portals? Like, yeah, that whole part, I was just like, I don't get it. This is why a lot of times I prefer pure epic fantasy instead of fantasy that's based in reality because then I'm like, well, you need to make things believable then because you're including reality so I need some realism in here. That's just, I guess that's just me. Um, another thing too is that the whole night at the museum ending uh, with the fucking branch that brings the taxidermy to life or whatever. Why the fuck did the branch not go back to its own world while Simon and Kara were in there for that long? Like they were in there for at least a day, right? And the branch is trying to go back. So why the fuck didn't it go back? There's a giant hole in the wall that didn't get covered by anything while they were gone. That just seemed like a huge plot hole. I was like, what the fuck? Then there's the other part where it's the guy who brought the branch over. Who the fuck was that guy? How did he get the branch? Like, I'm sorry, are there just holes that appear in the sky and just a piece of branch falls off? Like, no, he must have gone in there and cut a piece off of the fucking willow tree and come back with it. So then... I don't know. I just basically I think that this book would have been a lot more interesting and a lot better if it actually hadn't been told from Kara's point of view. If it hadn't been focused on Kara at all. If it had either been the weird peddler man who sold the branch to whatever the fuck his name was, or if it had been the story of the guy who wrote in the Bible. Like that would have been so much better. I would have loved that. I also like Everything pointed toward the uncle being suspicious. Everything. And he wasn't? Whatever. That just, yeah. There were just so many things that I was like, why? Why isn't it this? Why is it that? <laughs> Alright, on to the next book. Alright, next book is The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. This book is more of a fantasy horror. Um, I definitely would say more like dark fantasy than horror. There are some some like horrific moments no real body horror there are terrible despicable things that people do to each other in here um but i did enjoy this book quite a bit so we follow our main character uh emmanuel who was born to a mother i don't think she was married to this man but she definitely you know had a strong relationship with a black man who lived on the outskirts of 
uh, Bethel, or it's like a township, I guess, called Bethel, and there's a par like there's a part of Bethel that is called the outskirts, and that's where all the black people live. You know, just they are just manual labor and your basic like colonial times kind of setting, really, where it's kind of dark and gloomy. Um, there's this extreme puritanical pious side of Bethel where, you know, if you pray, if you ask for the Father's forgiveness, then you will be fine. Um, women are only allowed to read certain parts of the scriptures or whatever. And so Emmanuel, she's trying her best to be a part of this society, follow the rules, because she doesn't want anyone to think that she's like her mother, because her mother was accused of consorting with witches which in this book are also associated with the mother. So there's this huge dynamic between the father and the mother. The father obviously being the god and the, the um, venerated deity of Bethel, and the mother is kind of this like, well she's basically like a witch. She's actually Lilith, I guess, but there are no actual straightforward references to like the Bible or Christianity in this book, but it's pretty obvious what it's trying to say. It's not so subtle. Um, but the mother uh, exists in the forest, so you know, don't go to the forest. Don't do that. That's bad. Emmanuel slowly is being called to the forest and basically this whole story is about her kind of realizing Maybe there's more to Bethel than it says it is because, again, like, she's kind of brainwashed into thinking that, you know, oh, the father is good, you know, as long as you do the right thing, you will always be forgiven, um, that their uh, pastor or priest or whatever the fuck his name is, who's basically like their mayor, I guess, um, she's like, you know, he is a good man, but then secrets get revealed. This whole book is really a lot about... A girl fighting to find the truth. It's very feminist, I'd say, but it doesn't push that uh, huge, like, feminist ideal very hard. Like, it just... You have a strong main character. I think this is why I really enjoyed the book, is because Emmanuel was a really good character. She asked the right questions. Um, she never really did something that was super stupid that I hated. Like. It was a good female character, which, you know, you don't always get. Um, and there is a relationship in this one where, of course, it's with the son of the pastor guy who's supposed to inherit Bethel and become the head of the church, I guess. But he's rebellious, you know, and he enjoys this half-black girl who has this witchy side to her. And I actually very much enjoyed their relationship because it never felt like he was there to save her. Like, he was there to help her and she never really needed the help that much, but obviously it was welcome. Like, it, it made it easier. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. I'm never, I'm never a fan of relationships in books where you have a badass female character and then the guy shows up and all of a sudden, like, she's super submissive and is no longer badass and it's just him, he's like there to save the day. I hate that shit, but this book didn't do that, which I was, I was very happy about. Um, so yes, in general, I very much enjoyed the writing. I did like the pacing, because so basically there's like plagues happening. Um, what was it again? Blood, blight, black, and, and slaughter? I don't, whatever, something like that. Um, so there are different plagues happening and Emmanuel is trying to figure out why they're happening. Um, you know, is it a punishment for Bethel for all the secrets that it's kept and blah, blah, blah. So in general, I enjoyed it. I really liked the setting. I loved how dark it was. I honestly, I loved how goth it was. <laughs> like, I don't know exactly what constitutes a gothic novel. You know, how we talk about gothic lit. Um, but this was goth as shit with like blood seeping out of the dirt and constant darkness. I do have just like one thing that kind of bothered me, which is why this book wasn't like absolutely amazing for me. It's very cliched. Like, you know, she will always do the right thing. 
um, you know, her moral values are pure and honest, like, I don't know, for me, it's like, I've been fucked over my whole life, um, if I have a chance to say, yeah, fuck all y'all, then I'll probably do it, so I guess my point is that none of the characters in here were morally gray. They were very, like, straightforward with who they were, so that's why I enjoyed it, but there were times I was like, mm. <laughs> That's kind of a basic thing to happen there. I do have a couple spoilers. Uh, the first one is is the witches in the woods, so the mother. Um, but there were different witches. There were like the 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 couple one, and there was the like water one. That's basically how I remember that. I don't remember their names. But I, like for me, I was like, were they real people? I would have liked to know that more. Also, another thing, the outskirts. Um, I feel like I would have wanted more screen time of the outskirts just to know what their relationship was like a little more. Like what what the outskirts relationship was with Bethel. Were they part of Bethel? Like because there's like a gate that you can leave to leave Bethel but they don't let anyone leave. And I'm like but so the outskirts is in Bethel? I don't know. I would have liked to understand that more. and since they hated black people so much, like, why, why would they have them around, I guess? Yeah, ah, I was confused by that. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, Ezra and Emmanuel, they, like, broke up after the blood plague. I didn't understand, I understood kind of why, but then they just stopped talking altogether, and I was like, like, why? Like, I get that that was a traumatizing moment, right? Very traumatizing for Ezra. Um, but I didn't quite, yeah, I didn't, I don't think I understood what kind of logic went through their minds of doing that, because then they just end up helping each other again. It's just those three things that I guess I still have some questions on for this book. But overall, good book. So I recommend, I recommend reading it if you want something that's witchy, darkish. Not very funny, but very well written. A little gothic, if you want some blood. Uh, so yeah, that's it for these books. Uh, if you enjoyed this, you know, the usual shenanigans that YouTube asks for its algorithm to work. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.